The cold steel of handcuffs bit into Tanya Johnson's wrists as she stared in disbelief at the two police officers manhandling her. Just moments ago, she had been jogging through her Oakland neighborhood, enjoying the crisp morning air. Now, she found herself thrust against the hood of a patrol car, her rights being read in a monotone voice. You're under arrest for burglary, the male officer growled. Tanya's mind raced. Burglary? She was a law student, not a criminal. As passers-by began to gather, smartphones recording the scene, Tanya made a silent vow. This injustice would not stand. The early morning sun cast a warm glow over the tree-lined streets of Oakland's Rockridge neighborhood as Tanya Johnson stepped out of her modest apartment. At 28 years old, she cut an impressive figure in her running gear, her natural curls pulled back into a tight ponytail. As she began her daily jog, her mind was already racing with thoughts of the day ahead. Classes at UC Berkeley School of Law, a study group meeting, and preparations for her upcoming internship application. Tanya had always been driven. Growing up in a working-class family in East Oakland, she'd witnessed firsthand the impact of systemic inequality. Her parents, both hardworking individuals, had instilled in her a deep sense of justice and the importance of education. Now, as a second-year law student, she was on the path to becoming the champion for change she'd always dreamed of being. As she rounded the corner onto College Avenue, Tanya allowed herself a small smile. The neighborhood was a far cry from where she grew up, but she'd earned her place here. Her scholarship to Berkeley Law was a testament to her intelligence and determination. Still, she couldn't shake the feeling of being an outsider in this predominantly white, affluent area. Lost in thought, Tanya almost missed the commotion up ahead. A group of people had gathered outside a Victorian-style home, their voices raised in alarm. As she slowed her pace, she caught snippets of conversation, something about a break-in. Curiosity peaked. She decided to take a closer look. That's when everything went sideways. Hey, you. Stop right there, a gruff voice called out. Tanya turned to see two police officers approaching rapidly, their hands on their holsters. Confusion washed over her as the male officer, a stocky man with close-cropped hair, reached for her arm. Officer, what's going on? Tanya asked, her voice steady despite the sudden surge of adrenaline. Don't play dumb, the female officer snapped, her blue eyes cold. We got a call about a burglar in the area. African-American, athletic build, wearing running clothes. You fit the description perfectly. Tanya's heart raced, but years of dealing with microaggressions had taught her to remain calm. There's been a mistake, she said firmly. I live in the neighborhood. I'm just out for my morning run. The male officer scoffed. Yeah, right. And I'm the mayor of Oakland. Turn around and put your hands behind your back. As the cold steel of the handcuffs bit into her wrists, Tanya's mind reeled. This couldn't be happening. Not to her. Not here. Not now. She was a law student for crying out loud. She knew her rights. I want to speak to a lawyer, Tanya demanded, her voice rising as the reality of the situation sank in. This is a mistake. I haven't done anything wrong. But her protests fell on deaf ears. The officers roughly guided her towards their patrol car, reciting her Miranda rights in a board, routine tone. Around them, neighbors had begun to gather, smartphones raised to capture the unfolding drama. As Tanya was thrust against the hood of the car, her cheek pressed against the cool metal, she caught sight of her reflection in the window. The woman staring back at her was someone she barely recognized, eyes wide with fear and disbelief, face contorted in a mix of anger and humiliation. In that moment, Something inside Tanya snapped. This wasn't just about her anymore. This was about every person of color who had ever been wrongly accused, every black body that had been unjustly handled by those sworn to protect and serve. As the patrol car door slammed shut behind her, 
Tanya made a silent vow. This injustice would not stand. The ride to the police station was a blur of sirens and silent fury. Tanya's mind raced, cataloging every detail of her arrest. The exact words used, the unnecessary force, the dismissal of her attempts to explain, she committed it all to memory. Her legal training kicked in, reminding her to stay silent, to wait for representation. At the station, the process was dehumanizing. Fingerprints, mugshots, personal belongings cataloged and taken away. With each step, Tanya felt her anger crystallizing into something harder, more focused. She thought of her parents, of the sacrifices they'd made to get her where she was. She thought of her fellow law students, probably settling into the library for a day of study. And she thought of all the nameless, faceless individuals who had stood where she stood now, without the benefit of her education and resources. Hours crawled by in the holding cell. Tanya sat on the hard bench, her back straight, her gaze steady. She refused to let them see her break. When a young officer came to inform her that she was being released, the real burglar had been caught a few blocks away. Tanya simply nodded. As she stepped out of the police station, squinting in the harsh afternoon light, Tanya was greeted by a familiar face. Professor Elaine Hawkins, her criminal law professor and mentor, stood waiting, concern etched on her features. Tanya, thank God, Professor Hawkins said, pulling her into a brief hug. Are you all right? What happened? Tanya took a deep breath, steadying herself. What happened, Professor, is that I just became a statistic. But I promise you this, I'm going to be the last one. Professor Hawkins nodded, understanding the steel in her student's voice. We'll fight this, Tanya. Every step of the way. As they walked to the professor's car, Tanya's mind was already formulating a plan. She would file a formal complaint. She would seek out media attention. She would rally her fellow law students, her community, anyone who would listen. This wasn't just about clearing her name anymore. It was about changing a system that allowed such injustices to occur in the first place. Settling into the passenger seat, Tanya caught her reflection in the side mirror. The woman looking back at her now was different from the one she'd seen in the patrol car window. This woman's eyes blazed with purpose, her jaw set with determination. In the span of a few hours, Tanya Johnson had transformed from a victim to a warrior. As Professor Hawkins pulled away from the curb, Tanya made a silent promise to herself and to every person who had ever been wrongly accused. This was only the beginning. The fight for justice was about to get a powerful new advocate. The days following Tanya Johnson's wrongful arrest passed in a whirlwind of activity. The fire that had ignited within her during those hours in custody now fueled her every waking moment. As she sat in Professor Hawkins' office, surrounded by stacks of legal texts and printouts of precedent cases, Tanya felt the weight of her newfound purpose settling on her shoulders. Tanya, are you sure you want to pursue this? Professor Hawkins asked, her voice tinged with concern. It could affect your studies, your future career prospects. Tanya met her mentor's gaze unflinchingly. Professor, what happened to me isn't just about me. It's about a system that's fundamentally broken. If I don't fight this, who will? The professor nodded, a mix of pride and worry crossing her features. All right then, let's get to work. Their first step was to file a formal complaint against the Oakland Police Department. Tanya spent hours meticulously documenting every detail of her arrest, from the initial confrontation to her release. As she wrote, the faces of the officers who had so casually dismissed her rights burned in her memory. But filing the complaint was just the beginning. Tanya knew that to effect real change, she needed to bring her story to light. With Professor Hawkins' guidance, she reached out to local media outlets. The response was immediate and overwhelming. Law student wrongfully arrested in Oakland racial profiling incident read the headline of the East Bay Times. 
Tanya's phone began ringing off the hook with interview requests from radio stations, TV news programs, and online publications. As Tanya stepped in front of the cameras for her first television interview, she felt a mix of nervousness and determination. The bright lights and probing questions were intimidating, but she remained focused on her message. What happened to me is not an isolated incident, she said, her voice steady and clear. It's a symptom of a larger problem of systemic racial profiling in our police force. And it needs to stop. The interview went viral, spreading across social media platforms like wildfire. Suddenly, Tanya found herself at the center of a national conversation about race, policing, and justice. But with visibility came challenges. As Tanya walked across the UC Berkeley campus, she could feel the weight of stares following her. Some were supportive, others skeptical, and a few outright hostile. She overheard whispers questioning her motives, suggesting she was seeking attention or trying to cash in on a lawsuit. The pressure began to take its toll. Tanya's grades started to slip as she juggled her studies with media appearances and meetings with community leaders. She found herself lying awake at night, replaying the arrest in her mind, second-guessing her decisions. It was during one of these sleepless nights that Tanya received an unexpected call. The voice on the other end belonged to Marcus Holloway, a prominent civil rights attorney known for taking on high-profile cases against law enforcement agencies. Ms. Johnson, Holloway said, his deep voice resonating with purpose, I've been following your story. I believe we can build a strong case not just against the officers involved in your arrest, but against the Oakland PD as a whole. Are you interested in pursuing legal action? Tanya's heart raced. This was an opportunity to take her fight to the next level, but it also meant committing to a long, grueling legal battle that could consume years of her life. Mr. Holloway, she replied after a moment's hesitation, I'm in. Whatever it takes to bring about change. With Holloway on board, Tanya's campaign gained new momentum. They began the painstaking process of building their case, gathering evidence of systemic racial profiling within the Oakland Police Department. Their breakthrough came in the form of a young officer named Michael Chin. Chun had been on the force for just over a year and had witnessed firsthand the culture of bias and discrimination that permeated the department. It's not just a few bad apples, Chin told Tanya and Holloway during a clandestine meeting. There's an unwritten policy of targeting certain neighborhoods, certain types of people. I can't stand by and watch it happen anymore. Chen's testimony was a game changer. With his insider information, Tanya and Holloway were able to uncover a pattern of discriminatory practices that stretched back years. As they prepared to file their lawsuit, the backlash intensified. Tanya began receiving anonymous threats via email and social media. Patrol cars would drive by her apartment slowly, their occupants staring menacingly. The police union issued a statement denouncing Tanya as an attention seeker who was endangering public safety by undermining trust in law enforcement. The pressure reached a boiling point one evening as Tanya was leaving the law library. As she approached her car, she noticed a group of men lounging nearby, their faces hidden in the shadows. Hey, troublemaker, one of them called out. Why don't you just drop this whole thing? You're in way over your head. Tanya's hand tightened on her keys as she quickened her pace. Her heart pounded in her chest, but she refused to show fear. As she reached her car, she turned to face the men. I'm not dropping anything, she said, her voice ringing out in the quiet parking lot. And if you think intimidation tactics are going to work, you clearly don't know who you're dealing with. As she drove away, hands shaking on the steering wheel, Tanya realized that there was no turning back now. She was committed to this fight, no matter the personal cost. The next morning... Tanya and Holloway held a press conference on the steps of Oakland City Hall. 
Surrounded by a sea of reporters and supporters, Tanya announced their intention to file a federal civil rights lawsuit against the Oakland Police Department. This lawsuit is not just about seeking justice for one wrongful arrest, Tanya declared, her voice carrying across the crowd. It's about addressing the systemic issues that allow such incidents to occur. It's about holding our law enforcement agencies accountable to the communities they serve. And it's about ensuring that no one, regardless of their race or background, has to fear those who are sworn to protect them. As the crowd erupted in cheers and the cameras flashed, Tanya felt a mix of exhilaration and trepidation. She had just taken a massive step, one that would irrevocably change the course of her life. The road ahead would be difficult, filled with legal battles, public scrutiny, and personal sacrifices. But as she looked out at the faces in the crowd, faces of all colors, united in their support for her cause, Tanya knew she had made the right decision. This was bigger than her now. It was about justice, equality, and the fundamental rights that every American deserved. As the press conference wrapped up and Tanya prepared to file the official lawsuit, she couldn't help but think back to that morning jog that had changed everything. In the span of a few weeks, she had gone from law student to reluctant activist to the face of a movement. The real battle was just beginning. But Tanya Johnson was ready for it. The echo of Tanya Johnson's powerful words at the press conference reverberated across the nation. In the weeks that followed, her face became a familiar sight on news channels and social media feeds. The lawsuit against the Oakland Police Department had struck a chord, igniting a fierce debate about racial profiling and police accountability. As Tanya walked into the federal courthouse for the initial hearing, she felt the weight of countless eyes upon her. Supporters and protesters alike lined the steps, their chants creating a cacophony of sound. At her side, Marcus Holloway placed a reassuring hand on her shoulder. Remember, Tanya, he said, his voice low and steady. No matter what happens in there, we've already won by bringing this issue to light. Tanya nodded, squaring her shoulders as they pushed through the heavy doors. The courtroom was packed, the air thick with tension. As the proceedings began, Tanya listened intently, her law school training kicking in as she analyzed every argument, every objection. The breakthrough came unexpectedly. During a recess, a nervous-looking man approached Tanya and Holloway in the hallway. He introduced himself as Detective James Morrison, a 15-year veteran of the Oakland PD. I can't stay silent anymore, Morrison said, his voice barely above a whisper. What happened to you, Ms. Johnson? It's not an isolated incident. There's a systemic problem in our department, and I have proof. Tanya's heart raced as Morrison handed over a flash drive. This contains internal memos, unofficial quotas for stops in certain neighborhoods, even recordings of racist comments made during briefings. It's all in there. As Morrison hurried away, Tanya and Holloway exchanged stunned looks. This was the break they needed, a game-changer that could blow the case wide open. The impact of Morrison's whistleblowing was immediate and far-reaching. As the contents of the flash drive became public, the Oakland PD found itself under intense scrutiny. The mayor called for an independent investigation, and several high-ranking officers were placed on administrative leave. Tanya's lawsuit gained unprecedented traction. Media outlets clamored for interviews, civil rights organizations pledged their support, and donations poured in to fund the legal battle. For a moment, it seemed as though real change was within reach. But as the spotlight on Tanya intensified, so did the pressure. Her days became a blur of depositions, strategy meetings, and media appearances. Nights were spent poring over legal documents and preparing for upcoming court dates. Her law school studies, once her primary focus, now took a backseat to the all-consuming fight for justice. The toll on her personal life was equally heavy. Friends from before the arrest began to drift away, 
Unable to relate to her new reality, dating became nearly impossible. Potential partners were either intimidated by her newfound fame or seemed more interested in the attention it brought. One particularly grueling day, as Tanya dragged herself back to her apartment, she found her parents waiting at her door. The concern in their eyes was palpable. Baby, we're worried about you, her mother said, pulling her into a tight embrace. You're running yourself into the ground. Tanya felt tears welling up, the weight of the past months finally crashing down on her. I can't stop now, Mom, she said, her voice cracking. Too many people are counting on me. Her father's strong hand on her shoulder steadied her. We're proud of you, Tanya, but don't forget to take care of yourself. This fight needs you strong. Their words stuck with Tanya long after they left. As she lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling, doubts began to creep in. Was she really making a difference? Or was she just tilting at windmills, sacrificing her future for a fight she couldn't win? The next morning, Tanya woke to news that sent a chill down her spine. Detective Morrison, the whistleblower who had provided crucial evidence for their case, had been found unconscious in his home. The official report cited an accidental overdose, but Tanya couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to the story. As she rushed to the hospital, Tanya's mind raced. If this was indeed an attempt to silence Morrison, how far would her opponents go to stop her? The gravity of what she was up against hit her with full force. At the hospital, Tanya paced the waiting room, her anxiety mounting with each passing minute. When the doctor finally emerged, his face was grim. Detective Morrison is stable, but he's in a coma, the doctor explained. We can't say for certain when or if he'll regain consciousness. The news hit Tanya like a physical blow. Morrison's testimony was crucial to their case. Without him, much of the evidence they had gathered could be called into question. As she left the hospital, Tanya felt a mix of emotions she had never experienced before. Fear for her own safety warred with anger at the injustice of it all. Doubt in her ability to see this through clashed with a renewed determination to fight even harder. Standing in the hospital parking lot, Tanya made a decision. She pulled out her phone and dialed Holloway's number. Marcus, she said as soon as he picked up, we need to change our strategy. They're playing hardball now, and we need to be prepared. Holloway's voice was somber. I agree. This changes everything. Are you sure you're ready for what comes next? There's no going back from here. Tanya took a deep breath, looking up at the night sky. The stars seemed dimmer somehow, obscured by the harsh reality of the world she was now fully immersed in. I'm sure, she said, her voice steady despite the turmoil inside. Whatever it takes, we're seeing this through to the end. As she hung up the phone, Tanya felt a shift within herself. The idealistic law student who had started this journey was gone, replaced by a battle-hardened activist ready to take on the system by any means necessary. The fight for justice had entered a new, more dangerous phase, and Tanya Johnson was prepared to meet it head-on. The morning after Detective Morrison's hospitalization, Tanya woke to a world that felt fundamentally altered. The stakes of her fight against the Oakland Police Department had escalated beyond anything she could have imagined when she first filed her lawsuit. As she prepared for another day of legal battles, the weight of responsibility settled heavily on her shoulders. Tanya's phone buzzed with a text from Marcus Holloway, emergency meeting, my office, one hour. The urgency in those few words sent a jolt of adrenaline through her system. Something big was happening. When Tanya arrived at Holloway's office, she found him pacing, his usually calm demeanor replaced by barely contained fury. They're trying to bury us, he said without preamble, handing Tanya a thick folder. Anonymous tips have been flooding the DA's office, alleging everything from drug use to academic fraud on your part. Tanya's hands shook as she flipped through the documents. Each page contained a new, outrageous accusation against her. 
This is insane, she muttered. None of this is true. Holloway nodded grimly. Of course it's not, but they're throwing everything they can at the wall, hoping something will stick. They want to discredit you, Tanya. Make you toxic to the media, to potential supporters. The reality of the situation hit Tanya like a physical blow. This wasn't just about winning a lawsuit anymore. It was about preserving her reputation, her future, her very identity. What do we do? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. We fight back, Holloway said, his eyes blazing with determination. Every accusation, every lie, we counter it with the truth. But we need to be smart about this. They're playing dirty, and we can't afford to take the high road anymore. Over the next few weeks, Tanya found herself in a whirlwind of damage control. Press conferences, interviews, social media campaigns, every waking moment was dedicated to countering the smear campaign against her. She watched helplessly as former friends distanced themselves, unwilling to be caught in the crossfire. Even some of her professors at Berkeley Law began to treat her with a newfound wariness. The pressure was relentless. Tanya's inbox was flooded with hate mail and death threats. She couldn't walk down the street without being accosted by reporters or heckled by those who believed the lies being spread about her. The Oakland PD, while publicly denying any involvement in the smear campaign, seemed to take a perverse pleasure in her struggles. Patrol cars would cruise by her apartment at all hours, a not-so-subtle reminder that she was being watched. As the public tide began to turn against her, Tanya felt the foundations of her resolve starting to crack. Late one night, as she sat surrounded by case files and half-empty coffee cups, she allowed herself a moment of vulnerability. Tears streamed down her face as she confronted the possibility that maybe— just maybe, she had bitten off more than she could chew. It was in this moment of despair that her phone rang. The caller ID showed an unknown number. Hesitantly, Tanya answered. Miss Johnson, a trembling voice asked. My name is Sarah. I, I work as a clerk at the Oakland PD. I've seen what they're doing to you, and I can't stay silent anymore. I have information that could help your case. Tanya's heart raced. Could this be the break they needed? Or was it another trap? Sarah, she said carefully, I appreciate you reaching out, but I need to know I can trust you. Can we meet in person? The next day, Tanya and Holloway met Sarah in a quiet cafe across town. The young woman was visibly nervous, her eyes darting around the room as if expecting to be ambushed at any moment. What I'm about to show you, she said, sliding a USB drive across the table, could cost me my job. Maybe worse, but it's the right thing to do. Back at Holloway's office, they plugged in the drive with bated breath. What they found was explosive. Internal memos detailing the department's targeted harassment campaign against Tanya, orders to plant evidence, even discussions about how to neutralize Detective Morrison before he could testify. This is it. Holloway breathed, his eyes wide. This is the smoking gun we've been looking for. But their elation was short-lived. As they prepared to present their new evidence to the court, disaster struck. The night before a crucial hearing, Holloway's office was broken into. The USB drive, along with several key files, was stolen. The message was clear. Their opponents would stop at nothing to bury the truth. The setback was devastating. Without hard evidence, much of their case rested on testimony, testimony that was increasingly being called into question by the smear campaign against Tanya. As they sat in the courtroom, listening to the judge express skepticism about their claims, Tanya felt a sense of hopelessness washing over her. It was then that an unexpected ally emerged. Officer Michael Chen, the young cop who had initially spoken out about the department's discriminatory practices stepped forward. Despite the risks to his career and personal safety, Chin took the stand, corroborating much of what Sarah had revealed and providing firsthand accounts of the department's misconduct. Chen's testimony reignited the case, 
but it also marked him as a target. As he left the courthouse that day, he was ambushed by a group of fellow officers. The beating was swift and brutal, landing Chin in the hospital with severe injuries. The message was clear. This is what happens to those who break the blue wall of silence. The attack on Chin sent shockwaves through the community. Protests erupted outside the Oakland PD headquarters, with citizens demanding accountability and reform. The national media, which had begun to lose interest in Tanya's story, once again turned its spotlight on Oakland. For Tanya, the assault on Chun was a turning point. The guilt she felt for his suffering ward with a renewed determination to see this fight through to the end. She threw herself back into the case with a fervor that surprised even Holloway. But just as it seemed they were regaining momentum, the court delivered a crushing blow. Citing lack of admissible evidence and questioning the credibility of their witnesses, the judge issued a summary judgment in favor of the Oakland PD. In one fell swoop, months of work and sacrifice were wiped away. As Tanya stood on the courthouse steps, surrounded by a sea of disappointed supporters and gleeful opponents, she felt utterly defeated. The system she had believed in, the law she had dedicated her life to studying, had failed her. Failed all of them. Holloway placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. This isn't over, he said, his voice low and intense. We'll appeal. Take it all the way to the Supreme Court if we have to. But Tanya barely heard him. Her eyes were fixed on the crowd, on the faces of those who had put their faith in her. Mothers who feared for their sons every time they left the house. Young men who had been harassed and profiled their entire lives. Activists who had been fighting this battle long before Tanya entered the scene. In that moment, Tanya realized that the courtroom was just one battlefield in a much larger war. If the system wouldn't give them justice, they would have to find another way. As the crowd began to disperse, Tanya stepped up to the microphone that had been set up for a post-hearing statement. Her voice, when it came, was steady and filled with a newfound resolve. Today, we were denied justice in the courtroom, she began, her words carrying across the hushed crowd. But our fight is far from over. In fact, it's just beginning. We may have lost this battle, but we will not lose the war for equality, for accountability, for basic human dignity. As her impromptu speech continued, Tanya felt a shift in the energy around her. The despair that had threatened to engulf them all began to give way to something else, a collective determination, a shared purpose that transcended the legal defeat they had just suffered. This movement is bigger than any one case any one person, Tanya declared, her voice rising with passion. It's about changing a system that has failed us for far too long. And change, real change, doesn't always come from the top down. Sometimes, we have to build it from the ground up. As the crowd erupted in cheers and applause, Tanya knew that her journey had taken yet another unexpected turn. The courtroom battle might be over, but a new chapter in her fight for justice was just beginning. The echoes of Tanya Johnson's impassioned speech on the courthouse steps reverberated through Oakland and beyond. What had begun as a personal fight for justice had transformed into a rallying cry for systemic change. As Tanya stepped away from the microphone that day, she knew that the path forward would require a complete shift in strategy and mindset. In the weeks that followed the crushing legal defeat, Tanya found herself at a crossroads. The appeal process was underway, but she understood that real change couldn't wait for the slow grind of the justice system. It was time to take the fight to the streets, to the community, to the very heart of Oakland itself. We need to build a movement, Tanya declared during a strategy meeting with Marcus Holloway and a group of local activists. One that's too big, too loud, and too determined to be ignored. And so, from the ashes of their legal defeat, a grassroots campaign for police reform was born. Tanya threw herself into organizing with the same intensity she had once reserved for her law studies. 
She reached out to community leaders, civil rights organizations, and even sympathetic politicians to build a coalition. Their first major action was a peaceful protest march through the streets of Oakland. As Tanya stood at the head of the crowd, leading chants for justice and accountability, she felt a surge of hope. The turnout was beyond their wildest expectations, with thousands of citizens from all walks of life joining the cause. But with increased visibility came increased resistance. The Oakland Police Department, emboldened by their court victory, cracked down hard on the protesters. Tanya watched in horror as peaceful demonstrators were met with tear gas and rubber bullets. The very brutality they were protesting was on full display for the world to see. In the aftermath of the protest, as Tanya helped bail out arrested demonstrators, she received an unexpected call. It was Sarah, the police clerk who had provided crucial evidence before the break-in at Holloway's office. Tanya, I have more information, Sarah whispered, her voice tense with fear. There's a cover-up going all the way to the top. The mayor, the police chief, they're all involved. But I'm scared. I, I don't know who to trust. Tanya's mind raced. This could be the breakthrough they needed, but it could also be incredibly dangerous. Sarah, listen to me carefully, she said. We need to meet, but we have to be smart about this. I have an idea. Over the next few days, Tanya worked tirelessly to set up a secure method of communication with Sarah. They used encrypted messaging apps, burner phones, and even old-school dead drops to exchange information. Slowly but surely, a picture of widespread corruption within the Oakland city government began to emerge. Armed with this new information, Tanya and her team shifted their focus. They launched a multi-pronged campaign that combined continued street protests with targeted media exposés and social media blitzes. They created a website where whistleblowers could safely share information and worked with independent journalists to verify and publish damning reports. The impact was immediate and far-reaching. As more and more evidence of corruption came to light, public opinion began to shift dramatically. Citizens who had been on the fence were now joining the cause in droves. Even some police officers, disgusted by the actions of their superiors, began to speak out. Tanya's role evolved as well. No longer just a plaintiff in a lawsuit, she had become the face of a movement. She gave speeches at rallies, appeared on national news programs, and testified before the state legislature on the need for comprehensive police reform. But with her rising profile came new dangers. Death threats became a daily occurrence. Tanya had to move to a safe house, her movements constantly guarded by volunteers from the community. The strain was immense, but she refused to back down. Every threat, every attempt to silence us, just proves how necessary this fight is, she told her worried parents during a rare, quiet moment. We're making them scared. And that means we're making a difference. The turning point came when Tanya's team managed to obtain and release a series of incriminating emails between the mayor and the police chief. The emails detailed explicit plans to cover up instances of police brutality and to target activists like Tanya for harassment. The release of these emails sent shockwaves through Oakland and beyond. Calls for resignations and criminal investigations grew louder by the day. The mayor and police chief tried to deny the accusations, but the evidence was overwhelming. As the pressure mounted, cracks began to show in the once united front of the Oakland power structure. Lower level officials, fearing for their own careers, started to come forward with even more damaging information. It was in this atmosphere of mounting tension that Tanya received word that their appeal had been granted. The higher court, citing new evidence and the public outcry, had agreed to hear their case again. As Tanya stood before her supporters to announce this news, she felt a profound sense of transformation. The naive law student who had started this journey was gone, replaced by a battle-hardened activist who understood the true cost and value of justice. This is more than just a legal victory. 
Tanya declared, her voice ringing out over the cheering crowd. This is a victory for every person who refused to be silent in the face of injustice. For every whistleblower who risked everything to expose the truth. For every protester who stood strong in the face of intimidation. She paused, looking out at the sea of faces before her. Faces of all colors, ages, and backgrounds, united in their demand for change. But our work is far from over, Tanya continued, her voice filled with determination. This new trial is just one battle in a much larger war. A war for the soul of our justice system, for the future of our communities. And it's a war we intend to win. As the crowd erupted in cheers and applause, Tanya felt a surge of energy coursing through her. The road ahead would be challenging, but for the first time in months, she felt truly hopeful. They had overcome so much, transformed a personal injustice into a movement for change. And now, with the eyes of the nation upon them, they were ready to take their fight back to the courtroom. The battle for justice in Oakland was about to enter its final, decisive phase. The morning of the new trial dawned bright and clear over Oakland. As Tanya Johnson stood on the steps of the federal courthouse, surrounded by a sea of supporters, she felt the weight of the moment. This wasn't just about her anymore. It was about every person who had joined the fight for justice and police reform over the past tumultuous months. Inside the courtroom, the atmosphere was electric. Tanya and Marcus Holloway sat at the plaintiff's table, their posture confident despite the long road that had brought them here. Across the aisle, the representatives of the Oakland Police Department looked notably less assured, their ranks thinned by recent resignations and indictments. As the trial began, Tanya watched with a mix of pride and determination as Holloway presented their case. The evidence they had gathered, the testimonies of whistleblowers like Sarah and Officer Chin, and the damning emails they had uncovered painted a clear picture of systemic corruption and racial profiling within the Oakland PD. The defense tried to discredit their witnesses and downplay the significance of the evidence, but their arguments felt hollow in the face of the overwhelming case Tanya and her team had built. As the days wore on, it became increasingly clear that the tide had turned in their favor. The turning point came when Detective Morrison, having finally recovered from his suspicious accident, took the stand. His testimony, delivered with unwavering conviction, corroborated everything Tanya's team had alleged and more. The courtroom sat in stunned silence as Morrison detailed years of misconduct, cover-ups, and targeted harassment of minority communities. As the trial neared its conclusion, Tanya was called to the stand. Looking out at the packed courtroom, she saw faces that had become familiar over the course of her fight, supporters, fellow activists, and even some former detractors who had come to recognize the truth of her cause. Miss Johnson, Holloway began, can you tell the court, in your own words, why this case is so important? Tanya took a deep breath, her voice steady as she spoke. This case is about more than just one wrongful arrest. It's about a system that has failed its citizens, particularly those of color, for far too long. It's about holding those in power accountable for their actions. But most importantly, it's about creating a future where justice and equality are not just ideals, but realities for all people, regardless of their race or background. Her words seemed to resonate through the courtroom, and even the judge appeared moved by her sincerity and passion. When the verdict finally came, it was decisive. The court ruled in favor of Tanya and her co-plaintiffs, finding the Oakland Police Department guilty of systemic racial profiling and misconduct. The judge ordered sweeping reforms, including mandatory bias training, community oversight boards, and significant policy changes in how stops and arrests were conducted. As Tanya emerged from the courthouse, the cheers of the waiting crowd washed over her. Cameras flashed and reporters clamored for comments, 
But Tanya's eyes sought out the faces of those who had stood by her from the beginning, her parents, Professor Hawkins, Sarah, Officer Chen, and countless others who had risked everything for this moment. In the days that followed, the impact of their victory rippled out far beyond Oakland. Police departments across the country began proactively implementing reforms, eager to avoid similar lawsuits. Politicians at every level started pushing for comprehensive legislation to address police brutality and racial profiling. For Tanya, the end of the trial marked not an ending, but a new beginning. As she stood at the podium during a press conference a week after the verdict, she felt a sense of purpose stronger than ever before. This victory belongs to all of us, she declared, her voice ringing with emotion. But our work is far from over. We've opened the door to change, but now we must walk through it together. This is just the first step in building a justice system that truly serves and protects all members of our community. As the applause washed over her, Tanya reflected on the journey that had brought her to this moment. From a law student wrongfully arrested on a morning jog to the face of a national movement for police reform, she had been transformed by the fight for justice. The road ahead would not be easy, but Tanya Johnson was ready to lead the way, one step at a time, towards a more just and equitable future for all. If you liked the story, be sure to subscribe to the channel and like the video. And these two videos here will certainly touch you.